afternoon. Please, if possible, uh, remember that you can select your interpretation language. Select uh, the language, your preferred language in the interpretation button. Bien, buenos días, buenas tardes. Okay, tarde. good morning, good afternoon. Thank you so much for joining us today to this first event. We are reflecting on the climate change uh, meeting COP27. Today we'll be talking about the key outcomes of uh, COP27 and its implications for the Americas. We will focus on the results of the negotiations during the COP27, and we will focus on the information that countries need in order to develop adaptation and mitigation actions and to increase climate change resilience. This event is organized uh, jointly with Latino America 21 and PLOS Climate. Today, we have here with us three speakers from the region. I will introduce them one by one. So first of all, just a second, please. Vamos a empezar con Graciela. Let's begin with Graciela Raga. Graciela Raga has a BA in Meteorology awarded by the University of Buenos Aires and a PhD in Atmospheric Sciences awarded by the University of Washington in the United States. She has she had several research lines and she includes different projects, including synoptic and climate uh, phenomena. She has participated as a lead author in the fourth assessment of the state of climate change science published by the IPCC. And she was awarded an and sorry, the group was awarded in 2007 with the Nobel Peace Prize. In 2014, she was awarded the Prize for International Cooperation in Science, Technology and Innovation, uh, awarded to Argentinian personalities abroad. This was awarded by the Argentine Republic. She also coordinated the regional assessment of short-lived climate pollutants in Latin America and the Caribbean, sponsored by the Climate and Clean Air Coalition and by UN Environment, and this was published in 2018. She actually participated in outreach activities on atmospheric pollutants, interaction with clouds, and their effects on climate change. She is currently collaborating in the report Status and Perspective of Climate Change in Mexico. Thank you very much for accepting this invitation. Graciela will be sharing a presentation with us. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, Ines. I'm so sorry that I haven't been able to turn on my camera, but I think you can still see my presentation. Well, today, can you see my screen? Is that okay? Yes, that's okay. Great, thank you. Well, today I'd like to I would like to share with you these reflections and provide you with some uh, background information about the emission status, mainly in Latin America. As you know, global emissions, as you can see on this, on the left, on the left chart, in this case, this was prepared by uh, from data prepare, uh, taken from climatewatchdata.org. We can see in that in the in Latin America on the right, in the right, the contributions account for less than 10% of the global contributions. And this, this is a huge difference because energy generation globally in yellow, we have you know the, the largest number of emissions, but because of Latin America, but in Latin America, we mainly have hydropower, so the carbon, the energy footprint is much smaller. And also, so land use processes entail a larger percentage in our region. 
uh, regarding uh, contributions per country in Latin America, they amount to less than 10%, 10%, as I was saying. But we can see the top three countries are Argentina, Brazil, and Mexico throughout the region. Here I have the figures corresponding to each country. As you can see, the contributions are small. However, the impact, as we know, the impact should be addressed per country. Therefore, today I'd like to talk about uh, the commitments, you know, each country's commitments. Have a look at this uh, data taken from climatewatchdata.org. Here we can see the emissions per capita. These are Mexico's contributions, but also here we have Argentina and Brazil. We can also see the population because uh, Mexico is the one that contributes the least and Brazil is the one that contributes the most. But the per capita, the highest per capita figure is Argentinians. As usual, year after year, you know, we have a lot of knowledge. We attend the COP27. We have various IPCC reports, which confirm what we've known for 30 years already, uh, of course, in more detail. It, we get, you know, promises from countries. But what we know is that global emissions um, actually are not coherent with what we really need in order to keep uh, our temperature under 1.5 degrees. And this is a crucial decade, as reports keep saying, uh, you know, recent reports in the last 12 or 18 months. There is this crucial decade in order to really uh, reduce emissions. What do we know so far? Let us have a look at climateactiontracker.org. Here we can find a summary of the emission trajectories corresponding to each country. This one is Mexico, for instance. Um, here we can see the trajectories that we should have uh, for emissions for towards 2030. It's, it's only seven years away, actually. So in green is the reduction we would need regarding current emission levels so that uh, Mexico's emissions uh, are consistent uh, with this 1.5 reduction, 1.5 uh, degree that should be kept. Let us have a look at the graph line regarding policies and action, in this case uh, for, for Mexico, because Mexico aims to continue implementing these policies and action. However, the their actions are uh, insufficient in order to cover this 1.5 degree. So that was Mexico. Here we have the same information for Argentina and Brazil. You know, these are the three largest emission contributors in Latin America and the Caribbean. You know, they have promised, they have entered into different reduction commitments, etc. Even the Mexican Minister of Foreign Affairs at the COP, um, you know, uh, made a higher committee regarding CO2 emissions. However, these are insufficient. So what happened at the COP, you know, in this context? Um, many countries attempted to, in a way, you know, uh, Re, uh, make the commitment of, of keeping the temperature below 1.5 uh, more flexible, you know, and this it does not agree with the Paris Agreement because at that time we had decided to keep this increase under 1.5 uh, degrees. But as we can see from the uh, Latin American trajectories, these trajectories are higher. So, you know, making this commitment, that commitment more flexible, um, as I said, uh, endangered the, 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 the whole of the, the Paris Agreement text. Uh, sorry, the final text of the, of the COP27 doesn't explicitly say that we should 
uh, and uh, mineral carbon burning and exploitation. And this is essential. It doesn't say either that we should stop burning other fossil uh, uh, fossil fuels, because many countries have said that uh, cleaner fuels, such as natural gas, can be used in this transition. But actually, uh, we cannot. We cannot keep burning fossil fuels because they should be kept un, uh, underground. The text doesn't say that emissions should peak uh, in 2050 at the most in most countries. The text doesn't really state a clear path in order to, you know, stop using fossil fuels and to transition uh, towards uh, renewable energies. Therefore, the, the main context, you know, that we need to implement actions uh, to do this, you know, the actions to limit emissions, this well this is not really clear in the cop 27 text you know there is no urgent call to global energy transition and there is no call to nature-based solutions and and their implementation also the ndc commitments of each country regarding this these commitments uh, and there is a gap between what we need and the commitments uh, uh country commitments especially regarding our top three latin american countries therefore we need to reduce emissions um by around 50 percent by 2030 which is really hard to do because very few countries have a clear path in order to take the necessary actions to to implement such reductions so in that context there are, uh, uh, you know, false statements or barriers when it comes to the NDC, uh, the, the emissions report. So what was agreed has serious limitations. There are some rays of hope. My colleagues will mention them. Uh, what I wanted to show you was that when it comes to determining and identifying emissions specific emissions uh, this should be done globally this is a, a major project i would like to mention this was presented at the cop it's a climate trace project that will um, follow up situations in particular uh, this is the website climatetrace.org <clears throat> I wanted to show you how it works in real time. Let's see if it works. So he, this site shows us this globally. This project includes every satellite uh, owned by uh, different uh, country space satellites. Uh, agencies, sorry, and we can see. Have a look at the at the spots. We can see major emitting regions. For instance, this is a home page. This is the whole thing. We can zoom in and see different countries. Here we can uh, actually find uh, the the major uh, emissions. Have a look at this, for instance. If we click on this spot, we can even see that this is an offshore area. These are offshore emissions, and they correspond to the gas and oil sector. Here you can find information about which countries which and which sectors. This is interesting because I wanted to show you some of these unidentified spots, actually. And, um, and here the civil society can help. Because if they live near that place and they know uh, an, an, an identified area, for instance, and this tool, they can uh, identify the source, the emission source, and send us uh, an image with a geolocalizer so that um, 
the information can be entered in this project. Here they use AI algorithms. And the idea is to, you know, be able to identify some of these additional sources. That enables citizens to participate. And also there is feedback in this project. In our area, we have known for some time that there are some problems uh, when reporting. And there are some things that are uh, not reported, actually. Therefore, it's important to uh, achieve greater transparency when it comes to emissions uh, in each country and also em emission sources in order to conduct a more specific follow-up. Of course, this NGO doesn't aim to, uh, I don't know, detect or place a blame on, on, on someone in particular, but it does allow the society to know where the, where the major sources are in each country. Um, to round off, um, I would like to say that there are many topics that we can discuss. For, is, for instance, specific uh, actions, fraudulent campaigns uh, that you, you all know about, for instance. We need to uh, make uh, a greater effort, effort to demand transparency and uh, prevent uh, fake news from disseminating. Uh, something else that was very important at the COP27 was the participation of several civil society groups. And this was not included in the text. And that's something we could, uh, the, uh, we, we could further debate because, you know, these organizations are not being included. And some countries, uh, for instance, block the, the, the actual participation of women, etc. Um, there are many things to say then, but, uh, you know, I want to respect everyone's time. So now, thank you very much. I would like to give the floor to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you so much, Graciela. Thank you. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thanks. Thank you again, Graciela. Now, now let us go on to David Smith. David coordinates the Institute for Sustainable Development at the West, uh, West Indies University, who was an author of the United Nations Global Sustainable Development Report 2019. He is part of the Science and Policy Advisory Committee of the Inter-American Institute for Global Change Research. And he is a Caribbean Chair of the Sustainable Development Solutions Network. He managed the Jamaica Conservation and Development Trust. He helped to establish the Jamaican System of Protected Areas and the Environmental Foundation of Jamaica. He was a regional councillor of the World Conservation Union and assistant resident representative at the UNDP Jamaica for the Bahamas, Bermuda, Turks and Caicos Islands, Cayman Islands, and Jamaica. Thank you, David, for being here with us today. Please, you have the floor. Thank you very much, Irina. I would like to talk about COP27 from the perspective of the nearly 43 million people who live in islands in the Caribbean. Our perspective is a little different from those of you who live on the continent for several reasons. One is that in terms of the way climate affects us, and let us take climate departure, that is when our temperatures will get higher for the rest of our lives than they were before, the time for climate departure in many Caribbean countries is much earlier than for countries on the mainland. So for example, if we are looking at uh, a scenario where very little is being done to affect climate change, 
then cities in the Caribbean will experience climate departure from as early as 2023, going up to about 2034. In a scenario where more is being done, then those dates change to about 2028 to maybe as late as 2048. Unfortunately, we are as a world still heading towards maybe a two degree rise in temperature over historical limits. That's very bad news for people who live in Jamaica, in Haiti, in the Dominican Republic, in the Bahamas, for example. But it also affects people who live in Belize, in Honduras, in Nicaragua, and Guatemala, for example. So what has the COP done that we are particularly interested in and may be happy about. One of the most important things coming out of the COP was a decision on loss and damage, and to set up a fund that would allow countries to access that fund to address loss or damage caused by climate change. Another important aspect of COP is an understanding or an acknowledgement that especially for less developed countries, that adaptation is an extremely important facet of their development. So let's talk a little bit about the implications of the loss and damage fund and what it might mean to people who live in islands. Probably the most important thing that people think of when they think of climate change in islands is that they think of hurricanes and tropical cyclones because many times when hurricanes have passed through the Caribbean, you see it on the news. A category five storm will come and it'll affect islands, it will pass through Puerto Rico, it will then head on its way to, to, um, to Florida, or it might pass through the Dominican Republic and Haiti, and then Cuba, and then head off to Texas. Or it may affect Antigua, and then maybe Jamaica, and then head off in the general direction of, say, Belize. We all have seen the pictures of great destruction of people's homes after these massive storms. And we know that it's very, very important to help people after they've been affected by these events. And that's one of the reasons why loss and damage was a very important part of the COP27, and why we're very happy that there is a fund. But tropical cyclones are not the only, and sometimes maybe not even the most profound way in which climate affects people who live in islands. We're also affected by drought, but drought doesn't make it to the news, and it often doesn't excite the same level of interest when all that's been happening is, well, it hasn't rained in Cuba for 90 days, or the last time it rained in the Dominican Republic was last year. But droughts have a profound effect on our ability to grow our own food, to provide water for our citizens, and to live. It also affects things like diseases. We also need to bear in mind that climate has profound effects on health and also our ecology. A recent paper by Camilo Mora, in coming out, I think, two months ago, indicated that something over half of the pathogenic diseases that we experience as humans are affected by climate. But let's also think about ecology. Coral reefs. Coral reefs are going to be affected by climate change, both by the increase in temperature of the ocean and its increased acidity from maybe about 2034 onwards till about 2070. And different papers have said that if we continue to warm the globe at the rate we're warming, we're going to see a tipping point for coral reefs. So that's very worrying, because what they're saying is that somewhere between one degree above historical limits and two degrees above historical limits, we'll hit that tipping point, possibly around one and a half degrees, maybe a little more. Problem is we've already exceeded one degree and we're well on our way to two degrees. So what does that tipping point mean? The best guess is that 
the tipping point will last about 10 years. And within those 10 years, you'll see a massive destruction of coral reefs, something to like between 70 and 90% of reefs around the world will be destroyed. And if we hit two degrees, 99% of coral reefs around the world will be destroyed. That's particularly important for people who live in the Caribbean islands because coral reefs are where we get our fish from. It's also very, very important for people who live on the eastern coast of Mesoamerica, where the second longest coral reef barrier reef is, going all the way down that coast. Coral reefs provide fish. Coral reefs also are the bedrock of most of the tourism that takes place in the islands and in many of the coastal areas of Latin America and the Caribbean. In fact, something like 11 of the most tourism dependent economies on the planet are in the Caribbean. If 90% of coral reefs are destroyed, the coral reef supports the ecosystem which provides the white sand, which makes the beaches, and the beaches are the reason why tourists come to Cuba, to Jamaica, to the Dominican Republic, and all those places which we, we see on commercials. So there's going to be a profound effect on the livelihoods of all the economies when that tipping point is reached. My question then is, does the loss and damage fund have the sophistication to be able to compensate the countries that for their loss and damage due to the slow onset of acidification and high temperatures, and then when we hit that tipping point. Does the loss and damage fund have the ability to help us to deal with things like increase in diseases? My concern is that often, we look at many of the problems that climate um, causes as if they were possibly not complex or complicated problems. Not recognizing that a hurricane or a drought or changes in rainfall patterns can cause serious economic dis dislocation, can lead to an erosion of human capital and affects not just the built capital in a country, but many of the other kinds of capitals as well, which are important for reaching the sustainable development goals. And we should pay equal attention to slow moving events as we do to events such as cyclones, hurricanes, and so on. We're going to need new and better ways to be able to measure the economic impact or the extent of loss and damage. Many of our countries are already familiar with ECLAC's method of assessing damage and loss after an event. But we need better ways of being able to assess economic damage and loss, both before and after slow moving events and complex events. We're going to need new and better methods to be able to not just calculate the loss and damage, but to monitor and evaluate the, pro the effectiveness of the loss and damage fund as well as the increased need for adaptation funds. My concern is that one of the points made at COP27 was that the pledges that were made in COP26 were not met. I'm hoping that the pledges that were made in COP27 will be met. I believe though that we have a lot of work to do to create mechanisms that are fit for purpose and take into account the differences of the kinds of impacts that might take place in islands versus nearby continental systems. And that we need to put a lot of effort into that. And we need as countries, as scientists, as policymakers, to put a great deal of effort into moving the global mechanisms towards not just recognizing the different types of problems that we face, but in actually expending the money so that we can actually solve those problems. And I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Muchísimas gracias, David, por tus reflexiones. Thank you so much, David, for these reflections. We can see all your experience. Uh, please remember that we have a Q&A session at the end. 
Now, um, our final speaker is Brigitte Baptiste. She's a biologist, and since 2018, she has been the president of the uh, Colombian University. Between 2002 and 2019, she was a general director of the uh, Biological Resources uh, Institute, Alexander von Humboldt in Colombia. She's also a professor at the Javeriana University in Bogota, Colombia. She studied at the Autonomous University of Barcelona in Spain. She uh, did a master's degree. She was a full grade fellow at the Latin American Center for uh, Tropical Conservation. And she also studied at the University of Florida in Gatesby, where she got, she received a master's degree in Latin American studies. Thank you so much for being here with us today. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Irene. And uh, thank you to you all for this invitation. I would like to build a bit upon what uh, David has mentioned in terms of the fund for damage and loss. Uh, I think it's good news to have this uh, fund created finally, but it has the fund has a couple of implications that we need to develop better in the future. The first one, it's a uh, uh, that it's a fund that is uh, required to uh, confront the issues of um, environmental justice and climate climate justice, which is uh, on the text of the final declaration. And that's good. It's uh, interesting that for the first time we are talking officially about compensating for damage and loss. And this opens up a huge avenue for the future discussions on how climate is affecting negatively the economies and societies of the countries that do not contribute to the uh, atmospheric pollution with CO2. Um, if this is the avenue that we will come in the next uh, meetings of the ICCP and the UN Convention for Climate Change, uh, will face the trouble because everything will start to be presented as damage and loss. And uh, by this way, uh, we cannot pay for the destruction of the world. Uh, therefore, the second component of the discussion about the future of the fund has to do with prevention, adaptation, and perhaps even restoration. And let me talk about a bit restoration because uh, we are in the decade, the UN decade of uh, restoration. And there's a parallel effort by the multilateral agreements and institutions to uh, invite the countries and parties to um, invest on restoration projects. But this effort is not linked to the discussion that we have had in uh, Sharmel Sheikh, even if the uh, if the chairs of the initiative uh, were there discussing uh, how to really create those bridges between uh, the the agreements and this new initiative by the United Nations, but. Uh, restoration is a key issue for our countries in America and in the Caribbean because uh, we don't have the resources to rebuild the, um, the, the levels of ecological change, detrimental ecological change that has been produced because of uh, ill planet agrarian economies by the production of uh, of, uh, uh, of food and the transformation of the landscapes. So uh, what mm, would be interesting is to really create uh, better links between all the multilateral initiatives and the second replenishment of the uh, climate fund to deal with uh, restoration and with the mechanisms that restoration uh, should follow to really improve the quality of the ecosystems and to capture CO2, to create employment, to recover the soil and to recover biodiversity. Because there's very little um, development of, of those account, accountability mechanisms that we should 
have in place to really know if the use of the money is being uh, well done. And then I will move to the issue of accountability. Um, there's a complaint that the national reports, both on climate and biodiversity, are really very, I want perhaps I, I would risk the word forged, but they are, they portray a completely illusional situation, a complete false situation, because according them, if you add all of those reports, we already are living in the paradise. We are all solved the, the problems we are, we are facing. And that's not true. The evidence is on the contrary uh, opposite. Mm, so something that is missing still in the discussions is how to improve the quality of the national reports. And if there's gonna have, be a bit of accountability, formal ways of um, checking what the countries are saying about their initiatives in terms of mitigation, adaptation, restoration, and the use of the money that is coming from the uh, international funds. That, and that's quite important because countries need to build trust and to really um, be in the capacity of proving that each uh, peso, each dollar, each you know, whatever uh, currency are we using is well spent. There is a scarcity of resources. Uh, we have uh, deep problems uh, in terms of uh, health, in terms of migration. Uh, so priorities are not really aligned and uh, we are competing as uh, countries for money that is being put in many other um, uh, issues. So accountability, reporting, and uh, and then the accomplishment of different goals in different uh, levels is quite important. And that was already being said uh, when we assess the um, the development of the SDGs. How far have we gone? Uh, according to the national reports, we all, all of our countries are between this reaching the six, 60 and 70 percent of the requirements and goals of the SDGs, which is again totally false. So, how can we really have a system that measures the advancements of each country and the different stakeholders? in terms of the path towards biodiversity uh, recovery and the climate change adaptation. Um, finally, we need to think a bit on the mechanisms that uh, are being created to, to uh, mobilize the money. The, the COP27 didn't say many about that, uh, so we still uh, have institutional problems to um, uh, assess the ways money is better used, how it, how it is flowing, and of course, if the money is uh, facing problems with other investments that flow on the contrary and and, and the opposite their direction because there's huge amount of funds that are uh, still funding the coal and oil industries are on funding the destruction of the Amazon and the destruction of the oceans. And there was a paragraph on the final decision that uh, requires the national accounting systems and the financial the world financial system, as well as the banks to really participate and to take into account the decisions and requirements of the COP and the countries. But this is still something that the, perhaps the World Economic Forum or other economic forums have to deal with. But uh, uh, the COP27 didn't reach an interesting advancement uh, here. And finally, just to mention something positive, 
uh, the early warning uh, system, the early warning um, development uh, requirement that was agreed uh, upon uh, the beginning of this year. This has been also put on the table and uh, the decision requires and uh, invites the country and the parties to really work on creating and using this early warning system uh, in the next uh, few years uh, and with equity and the capacity to prevent the uh, extreme events that will or not the, not prevent the extreme events but at least to have a better idea or when uh, are they happening and who they are affecting um, so that's for now what i would like to contribute thank you very much Muchas gracias, Bridget. Hay una participante. Thank you, Bridget. Someone says that the chat is not enabled. Okay, it's enabled now. Thank you. Great. Okay. So, um, as participants start asking questions, I would like to ask Graciela about the Climate Tracker tool um, and how this tool allows people to participate. Utilizar esta herramienta. Graciela, how can people use this tool? How can we promote the use of this tool? Thank you. I think that this tool is a game changer in this regard because it allows everyone to make our contribution. We, we need to access the site and, uh, you know, contact. Um, uh, sorry, there's paper noise. Um, sorry about that. You need to contact, you know, the the people from the site. And also, there's another way to do this, which is important, because most people have access to mobiles with a GPS system that can, uh, you know, detect uh, locations, and they can also take pictures. Um, of, you know, specific sources, emission sources. So they can send this information uh, so that we, they, the site can detect if they are large emitters. And that actually makes a contribution to what is seen uh, as shown by the satellites. Because in some of the spots I showed you, there are emissions, but there is no more uh, information. There are not enough scientists that can actually go there and, and make the necessary observations. Therefore, I think this has to do with, you know, citizens, uh, citizen science, which I think is becoming more important, especially regarding contaminant emission in urban areas. But let's remember that contaminants in urban areas are connected with climate contaminants. Uh, so we need to remember to make this connection between urban con contamination and the contamination that actually causes climate change. So basically, uh, citizen science. Thank you, Graciela. I have a question addressed to Brigitte and David. Um, do you think that we do have the necessary institutional mechanisms to receive these uh, loss and damage funds? And someone is asking about the current financial mechanisms. For instance, the GSF has requirements that many developing countries cannot uh, comply with. So how can we change that so that we can receive the funds? David, maybe you can go first. Uh, that's a very good question. Uh, many of the existing mechanisms, the um, Global Environment Facility and to some extent the uh, Climate Fund as well, have been criticized because of the amount of regulations that you have to go through in order to receive funding from them and then to implement a project uh, under their rules and for many countries uh, particularly less developed countries uh, definitely with small island developing states they the regulations 
are a burden that actually prevents many of those countries from being able to get uh, funding that's necessary. Uh, it reduces the number of projects and it sometimes reduces the number of projects that can be done to very, very small or almost zero numbers. So I think if the idea of saying, okay, we've got this loss and damage fund, so therefore we can just simply say, okay, we'll we'll have the GCF or the, G, or, or the Global Environment Facility or the Climate Fund take it and run it is, while it's tempting, because it means you won't create a new fund, it's not necessarily going to work. And I think we need to look at other kinds of mechanisms. Uh, we have mechanisms that look at um, sort of disaster relief and uh, early recovery and recovery after events, which have some aspects which could be emulated. But we may need to come up with much better ways of allowing countries to access those funds and also to helping them to account for it and use it in the most effective way. We still have a long way to go on this. Gracias, David. Brigitte, no sé si quieres comentar. Thank you, David. Brigitte, maybe you'd like to say, to add something or answer a new question. Yeah, yeah. Indeed, the money that comes from GEF and other sources is very expensive money. Uh, you have to mobilize lots of local resources uh, to get uh, one of those projects. Uh, and in many cases, it's not worth the effort. And that's what hin is hindering the uh, arrival of, of the global money, the international money to specific projects. Also, in some cases, the only uh, institutions that are capable to um, show capacities and use those resources are big NGOs, global NGOs. And it's not necessarily they are aligned with the national policy. So there are struggles and uh, quarrel between the view of some NGOs and the national policies. And that is also uh, restraining the possibility of using the money to really address the needs of the country. So capacity building, which is always an issue that is brought upon the table in those discussions. Everybody agrees that capacity building is needed, but there's no mechanism for capacity building uh, uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in those agreements. And we perhaps need to think in a parallel initiative for capacity building and help our countries to develop the institutional capacities to deal with international funding. Because in, we, this is money that is keeping on the flow during the next decades. Uh, and it's increasing, it's an increasing amount of money and uh, we don't want to lose it because of corruption, because of uh, bureaucracy or because of inefficiency. So we perhaps need to ask uh, other in institutions to help uh, uh, the design of the new capacities and the up upgrade of them in, in our countries. Gracias, Brigitte. Tenemos también otra pregunta. No sé qué Thank you, dice. Brigitte. There's another question uh, to whomever would like to answer. Sergio, we know the situation and the role of large industries. So is it necessary to uh, create and support regional initiatives to uh, uh, guide, again, economies towards the smaller scale? Brigitte, Sergio, thank you very much. That's Bridget, a go ahead. quite important question because the private sector is learning very quickly how to adapt to the new financial requirements of the world. They know how, in some cases, fool the system again, and in some cases, to use it them well, to use those resources well to create sustainability. But uh, we really need a different uh, perspective for the private sector uh, on, in terms of the transition towards uh, renewables. And uh, uh, examples that perhaps can help us are coming from IPBES, who recently made a 
call for the assessment of business and biodiversity. Hopefully, IPES will be able to assemble a good team of people for doing that. And there are other uh, places where the big uh, corporations and other private uh, big names are meeting to discuss the issue. But you ask for small initiatives, such as regional and national initiatives. And uh, here, there are lots of questions about local economy, regional economies, decentralization, and the flow of funds with from the banks and the um, pension funds, in case there is private pension funds, then to match the other sources of uh, financial aid. Um, and I think also the governments need to talk to the private sector in, uh, in a, with a stronger voice, uh, of course, to invite them to do a better job in terms of adaptation and mitigation. Gracias, Brigitte. Tengo otra pregunta para Thank you, Brigitte. I have a question for Graciela because she talked about this in her presentation. But maybe we, we need more information about uh, the population increase uh, versus emissions. Maybe Graciela, you can tell us a bit more about that in the next few minutes. Yes, of course. Many times there is a way to, uh, you know, uh, stop paying attention to uh, the reduction of global emissions. And people might say to do this, to stop us from looking at this, they might say that the population, population is increasing and that's why emissions are increasing. But actually, um, there are many reports that state that, for instance, I think it's 160 million uh, of the wealthiest people have contributed over half uh, the emissions than the 3 billion people who are the poorest people in the world. And this is why we need to pay attention to per capita emissions. And that's why I mentioned this, because it clearly shows us that only the wealthiest people have been responsible for emissions and need to be held accountable uh, regarding, and they should bear the the burden of reducing emissions. This has to do with equity and climate justice as well, because it has to do with this issue. Also, it's important, what you were saying about the funds is very important regarding losses and damage. Uh, there should also be funds, although this, this whole thing is not very clear. But we must. What we must do urgently is reduce emissions so that the situation doesn't get worse. Because by the time they agree on the fund transfer mechanisms to countries, if we keep emitting like this, then the scenario will be even worse. So since you know, 1975. Uh, uh, Sagan made a presentation uh, at uh, to the U.S. Congress saying that uh, we had to reduce GAG emissions. So this is no secret. Um, uh, you know, uh, it's large industries that don't want uh, these emission reductions to actually take place because of you know the profits they make. So as a society, we must demand that this ends. Okay. Um, this is a question addressed to David. He has worked in the intergovernmental sectors and he works in society and from the education. Is there a hope for change? And what's your message from the education sector? Uh, definitely there is hope for change. Uh, in some cases, people will change because they see the future clearly and recognize that 
we have to make changes, otherwise our future will become quite untenable. And in some cases, we will wait until the bad things happen and then say, hey, how did this happen? And then make changes afterwards. Uh, the role of education is definitely to make sure, I think, that people understand what is happening, but also to understand the role that evidence plays in all of this. Climate change has always been controversial. I remember lecturers in my institution saying, nah, climate change isn't something that's taking place. This was many, many, many years ago. But bit by bit, people started to do research and found that, yes, the climate is changing. When you take these data and you look at what happened 100 years ago or 200 years ago, they are different. What I think is most important and the th most important contribution we can make um, in education and also in the interface between science and policy is to make sure that people understand, one, that there is evidence, two, what that evidence is saying, and three, what we can do about it. Because otherwise people will tend to think that this is something which people from a particular group have come up with because they don't like various things. It's an invention of people who are vegetarians because they don't want us growing cattle and so on and so forth, or something like that. It's very important, I think, that the evidence is clear and everybody knows where it comes from, so that the argument is about the evidence and not about the opinions. And I think it, that goes as well to the point that Brigitte had made about the reports that come out of the different parties from time to time, which make it seem like, yes, we're well on our way to solving this problem when the objective evidence is that we are not. And we need to make sure that people understand the evidence more, but also that that kind of evidence is available to anyone who wants it. So we really should be pushing open science and open data and making sure people know where you can get the facts. Muchísimas gracias, David, por concluir. Thank you so much, David, for your final words. This is the first session of three sessions we'll have to debate the COP27 results. Thank you, Garacila Arraga, Brigitte Baptiste, and David Smith for being here with us today. We'll be sharing the link to the recording so that you can disseminate this with your colleagues. So this is the end of the workshop. Thank you to the panelists and to the participants. See you soon. Bye.